Hello everyone, welcome back to History 2001, Launching America. In our last video, we discussed the U.S. Civil War from 1861 to 1862. We discussed the grand strategies of the Union and Confederate high commands and how they approached the war. In particular, we discussed the Union high commands limited war approach and how the Union gradually escalated uh, the way they fought the war, as seen with the Emancipation Proclamation of 1862. We also discussed some of the major battles fought in 1861 and 1862, how they were emblematic of the strategies used by the Union and the Confederacy, and we discussed the individual soldiers of the Union and the Confederate armies how they understood the war and what motivated them to fight. In this video, we will discuss how the Civil War changed, both in the reasons why people fought and how the war was conducted. We will discuss some major representative battles, but we will also discuss the lives of civilians who were on the home front during the Civil War as well, from 1863 to the conflict's end in 1865. On the Western Theater, in 1863, General Grant, whom we discussed previously, continued the River War and worked to capture Vicksburg, Mississippi, the last Confederate stronghold on the Mississippi River. Seizing Vicksburg would give the Union full control of the Mississippi River, effectively dividing the Confederacy in twain and depriving the CSA of much needed beef from Texas. Additionally, Union troops would attack and invade several Confederate ports on the Gulf Coast as well to prevent Confederate blockade runners from resupplying the CSA. New Orleans, the CSA's most important Gulf port and the largest of all Confederate port cities, had fallen to the Union back in the summer of 1862, as discussed previously. The capture of Vicksburg would only complete the U.S.'s control of the Mississippi River. Lincoln famously said that Vicksburg was the key to defeating the Confederacy, and the Union could only win once it had been put in our pocket. In his plan to attack Vicksburg, Grant devised a bold strategy that would require the coordination of U.S. naval and army forces. Vicksburg sat at a bend on the Mississippi River, and in order to capture the city, Grant believed that he would need to run the gauntlet, sail downriver past the city under fire from Vicksburg, and deploy his troops south of the town, which was heavily fortified. Grant had tried to build a canal across the bend to circumvent the city, but the work proved too difficult. Assaulting the city from the river via an amphibious landing was out of the question as well due to the fact that Vicksburg was built on a series of hills overlooking the river. Instead, Grant deployed his troops downriver and advanced from the southeast in May and June of 1863. As Grant's army advanced on Vicksburg, it fought several battles along the way. Grant failed to take Vicksburg on his initial assaults because the city was well guarded and so he settled in for a siege. Grant received supplies by living off the Confederate countryside, but the Confederates trapped in Vicksburg, along with the city's civilian residents, had nothing to eat, and were reduced to eating shoe leather, rats, mules, and even their beloved house pets. The Union was also shelling the city, forcing Vicksburg's denizens to abandon their homes and live in bunkers dug in the hills surrounding the city. In the end, Vicksburg's Confederate force, about 33,000, surrendered to Grant's 77,000-man army on July 4, 1863. The defeat of the Confederates at Vicksburg did three things. One, it gave the Union undisputed control of the Mississippi River, dividing the Confederacy in two. And two, 
The Union victory freed up Grant's troops, the Army of the Tennessee, allowing them to be transferred to the fighting in the eastern Tennessee and northern Georgia part of the Western Theater. Third, Grant's success at Vicksburg and throughout the rivers of the Western Theater eventually convinced Lincoln to promote Grant to general in chief and to bring him to fight in the East. The loss of Vicksburg was a major turning point in the Civil War. Now we will talk about the other turning point in the Civil War, the Battle of Gettysburg. The Battle of Gettysburg was fought on July 1st through 3rd, 1863, in a small town in southern Pennsylvania. Before we talk about the Battle of Gettysburg, why it happened, and why it was so important, let me provide some context about the war in the Eastern Theater in 1863. Because of his failures at Fredericksburg, Ambrose Burnside was removed as commander of the Army of the Potomac. He was replaced by Joseph Fighting Joe Hooker. Hooker had been a capable corps commander, seeing service in battles like Antietam, where he was wounded. He also had a reputation as an aggressive and bold officer, the kind of military leader Lincoln believed could give the Union the upper hand in the East, where it had been struggling for most of the war. Hooker was tall and considered handsome by the standards of the day. He was also well liked by his men, although not as much as McClellan had been. Hooker also had a reputation for drinking, carousing, and patronizing sex workers, although Hooker himself resented these rumors. It should be noted that contrary to popular belief, Joseph Hooker is not the reason sex workers are often referred to as hookers. The term had already been in use for about 20 years by the time of the Civil War. Anyway, Hooker planned a bold assault on Lee's army. Hooker planned to use his cavalry to assault the Confederate rear, and then with his infantry and artillery, Hooker would envelop and surround the Confederates. Hooker's Army of the Potomac was over 133,000 strong, and he outnumbered Lee two to one. Hooker was convinced that his plan would work, declaring that God should have mercy on Lee, for he would have none. Lincoln was a little bit more skeptical and had begun to think that his new general was too arrogant for his own good. Lincoln warned Hooker about his arrogance, saying, the hen is the wisest of all animal creation because she never cackles until the egg is laid. Hooker, however, was convinced his plan would work and his plan was good on paper. Unfortunately for Hooker and his plan, the spring rains swelled the rivers and flooded the roads of Northern Virginia, delaying the deployment of Hooker's troops and slowing their movement. Additionally, Hooker had not fully reconnoitered the grounds over which his army would move. Much of the land the Army of the Potomac would have to cross was called the Wilderness. The Wilderness had once been a longleaf pine forest, but the old growth had been cut down in the 1700s as colonial Virginians needed fuel to fire their pig iron furnaces. In place of the trees, the ground that became the Wilderness was choked with brush thick bushes, and thorny brambles. It was an unpleasant place to fight a battle, and the thickness of the brush made it more difficult for Hooker to deploy his artillery. Hooker, against the wishes of his subordinates, ordered his army to actually deploy in the wilderness, where he hoped Lee's smaller force would attack him and be destroyed. General Lee, realizing Hooker's very obvious plan, split his force in two, giving the command of half of his Army of Northern Virginia to General Jackson, his most trusted and capable subordinate. Jackson moved southwest around Hooker with the help of General J.E.B. Jeb Stewart, who kept the Federals distracted. In the end, Lee used the envelopment attack on Hooker that the duped Union general had tried to use on him. On May 2nd, Jackson's men stormed the Union position in the wilderness, startling the unprepared Federals in their camps. 
The Union line collapsed in the face of Jackson's unexpected attack, and Hooker was unable to effectively rally his army. General Jackson wanted to continue pushing against Hooker that evening, but he was shot by a detachment of his own troops, who mistook him for Union cavalry in the darkness of the wilderness. Because of his wounds, Jackson's left arm was amputated, and he eventually died from pneumonia, a complication from the friendly fire incident. Lee famously declared, after Stonewall's wounding and death, that Jackson had lost his left arm, but Lee had lost his right. In the end, the Battle of Chancellorsville was a major Confederate victory. Lee had used a brilliant strategy to defeat a much larger Union force, but it was a costly victory, leading to the death of Stonewall Jackson, one of Lee's best commanders. Scholars debate how the death of Stonewall Jackson impacted the Confederate war effort. Some argue that Jackson's death was a major blow, but not enough to have a significant effect on their war effort. Others argue that without Jackson, Lee was a far less capable and effective general, leading to his defeat at Gettysburg and in the war itself. After Chancellorsville, Lee and Jefferson Davis came to the agreement that the Army of Northern Virginia should once again invade the North, as opposed to sending troops west to relieve Grant's ongoing siege of Vicksburg, which we talked about previously. Instead of focusing on Maryland, as had been done in 1862, this time Lee would push further north into Pennsylvania, threatening Washington, D.C., but also the major northern city of Philadelphia. In a series of battles in June 1863, Lee divided his army in half and began his northward advance with troops both east and west of the Union Army. The Army of the Potomac was in no position to stop Lee. Hooker retreated in an attempt to block Lee but was removed from command at the end of June. Hooker was replaced by George Gordon Meade, one of his corps commanders. Meade was far more cautious than Hooker, but less so than McClellan. By the way, in terms of organization, Civil War armies on both the Union and the Confederate side were made up of units called corps, divisions, brigades, and regiments. Regiments were supposed to have 1,000 troops and were usually made up of men who came from the same home communities, and they were commanded by a colonel. Brigades typically had three regiments, with about 3,000 troops in all, and were commanded by brigadier generals. A division typically contained four brigades for about 12,000 troops in total, and was commanded by a major general. An army would have several corps, each of which was commanded by a major general as well. Artillery and cavalry corps were broken down in a similar manner, but artillery corps were often broken down and divided throughout the infantry. As this slide shows, sometimes the numbers for the size of individual regiments and brigades varied based on casualties and attrition. Lee's Army of Northern Virginia invaded northward through Maryland and Pennsylvania. Lee recognized that forcing the Union to fight on its own ground would be demoralizing to the people of the North, and it could take pressure off the beleaguered Virginian countryside, which had been decimated by both the Union and Confederate armies in their struggle for food, fuel, and beasts of burden. Lee urged his men to not anger at the Pennsylvanians with whom they came into contact, fearing that depredations against civilians would strengthen the Northern resolve. He ordered them to compensate the civilians with Confederate money, although the Northerners would not be able to use this currency. The Confederate army also took food and livestock as it marched northward. Unfortunately, the Confederates also captured African Americans that were living in Pennsylvania, whom they believed were escaped slaves. Many of the black people they captured were not former slaves, but freeborn Northerners. Lee's forces converged at the small town of Gettysburg, a sleepy college town in southern Pennsylvania, which was rumored to have a large supply of shoes 
which the footsore Army of Northern Virginia desperately needed. Union cavalry, commanded by General John Buford, had discovered that the Confederates were converging on Gettysburg. He ordered his cavalrymen to dismount their horses and to take cover on Seminary Ridge, a collection of hills west of the city, so-called because a Lutheran seminary was built on their crest. Buford's troopers fired their repeating rifles at the advancing Confederates, and though outnumbered, they held their position long enough for the slower-moving Union infantry to arrive. By the way, cavalrymen during the Civil War were typically armed with breech-loading repeating rifles or revolvers, while infantrymen generally carried muzzle-loading rifled muskets, which were slower to load. The Union and Confederate governments could not afford the cost of the more expensive breech-loading ammunition and cartridges, and thus issued the older, cheaper, and slower rifled muskets to the infantry, who made up the bulk of their armed forces. The first Union infantry to arrive at Gettysburg was the First Corps, commanded by Major General John Reynolds. Lincoln had initially offered Reynolds the job of commanding the Army of the Potomac after the removal of Joe Hooker. Reynolds turned down Lincoln's offer, arguing that Lincoln would not give him free reign as a commander. Consequently, Lincoln chose George Meade instead. Reynolds bravely led his troops against the Confederates, but was killed by an enemy sniper. In the chaos of Reynolds' death, the Union was forced to retreat from Seminary Ridge, instead taking up defensive positions on Cemetery Ridge, just to the southeast of Gettysburg. Seminary and Cemetery. Confusing, I know. Additional Confederate troops arrived late on July 1st and in the early hours of July 2nd. On the second day of fighting, General Lee prepared to attack Meade and his troops. He wanted to dislodge and defeat Meade before additional Union reinforcements arrived. Lee was short on military intelligence. Due to losing contact with his cavalry commander, Lieutenant General Jeb Stuart. Remember, just like during the Revolutionary War, the cavalry were an army's eyes and ears, and they were especially important when an army was deployed in hostile territory. To defeat the Union, Lee planned a flanking operation. Lee would capture a series of heights at the southwestern, far left flank of the Union line. From this point, Lee could then shell the Union with artillery and advance with infantry small arms fire. Remember, this tactic was called enfilading, and it was a deadly attack during the days of close order pitch battles. To this end, Lee ordered General James Longstreet, whom he called Old Warhorse for his reliability, to capture the hill that anchored the Union left flank. This hill was called Little Round Top. As the Confederate troops advanced across open ground west of the hill, the peach orchard and the wheat field, Governor K. Warren, Meade's chief engineer, recognized the Confederates' plan and ordered infantry and artillery to dig in on Little Round Top. The Confederates assaulted Little Round Top, but the position was too difficult to take, and Union troops of the 20th Maine Regiment, commanded by Lieutenant Colonel Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain, defeated a much larger Confederate force using a bayonet charge, which they had been forced to do because they had run out of ammunition in the fight. The, Federates, the Confederates tried to carry the Union right flank as well at Culp's Hill, but their efforts there failed as well. On the third day of battle, July 3rd, Lee planned to divide the Union line in two, hoping to use his smaller force to defeat the Federal Army in detail. The Confederates shelled the Union line throughout the early afternoon to soften up the Federals before the attack. At 3 p.m., Lee prepared his advance, which would be led by a division commanded by Major General George Pickett, about 12,500 troops. Pickett's division advanced on the Union line, which was dug in on Cemetery Ridge and hiding behind a stone fence called the Angle. Pickett's troops had to advance over a mile across open ground 
sustaining attacks from enemy artillery and small arms fire along the way. As they approached the fence, they began to charge. Pickett's division briefly broke through the Union line at the angle, but were quickly repulsed by Union small arms and artillery fire, which fired canister shots, which were like giant shotgun shells. Pickett's charge, in the end, was a failure for Lee and the Confederates. It has been referred to as the high watermark of the Confederacy, because if it had succeeded, Meade's army would have been defeated and the war might have been ended due to a major Confederate victory in the North. This did not happen, however, and what was left of Pickett's division was forced to retreat back to Seminary Ridge. As the exhausted, battle-weary Confederate troops retreated to their line, Lee greeted Pickett and ordered him to reform his division. Pickett famously replied that he no longer had a division to lead. The failure of Pickett's charge demoralized the Confederates, but General Meade refused to counterattack on July 3rd or the next day, July 4th. Some scholars speculate that if Meade had counterattacked and destroyed the Confederate army, then the Civil War would have ended in 1863. Although Meade had allowed Lee to retreat, Gettysburg, in the end, was a major victory for the Union. The U.S. military had defeated an invasion into its own territory. Its 104,000 strong force prevailed over the Confederates, losing about 23,000 casualties to the 75,000-man Confederate force, while inflicting up to 28,000 on its enemy. Gettysburg was the largest and bloodiest battle of the Civil War. The victory of Gettysburg, combined with the Union's capture of Vicksburg, were considered the turning points of the Civil War. These victories convinced both President Lincoln and foreign observers, namely Britain, that the Union was going to win the Civil War. Lincoln's resolve against the CSA strengthened, and British Prime Minister Viscount Palmerston decided to refuse recognition of the Confederate States of America keeping Britain out of the war. France, under Napoleon III, would follow Britain's lead and refuse to assist the Confederacy. Although the Union had earned some major victories at Vicksburg in the west and Gettysburg in the east, all was not well on the Union home front. War weariness was settling in, the Union public. Enlistments have been going down um, towards the end of 1862 and throughout 1863. Even with uh, victories like Vicksburg and Gettysburg, uh, casualty numbers were very high, and the Union also sustained some pretty serious defeats in 1863 as well. Um, the Battle of Chancellorsville earlier in the war in May that we talked about previously and the Battle of Chickamauga in uh, Georgia, in the Western Theater, was the second bloodiest battle in the Civil War. Um, only Gettysburg was more, uh, saw more casualties than Chickamauga. And Chickamauga was a major Confederate victory. So uh, even with the victories the Union is experiencing, they're experiencing some defeats in 1863 as well, which are causing um, um, volunteerism to decrease in the Union public. Uh, in 1862, uh, the Union had uh, created a Militia Act that would allow states to draft militiamen from state militias to make up for their shortfalls in their volunteer uh, quotas. Every state had to supply to the Union a certain number of soldiers to fight in the Union Army. If a state was not providing enough volunteers, it could draft uh, people that were in state militias and have them fight in the Union Army. But in 1863, um, more extensive draft laws were passed in the Union. Um, in the 1863 draft laws, now the Union government, the U.S. government, oversaw the uh, conscription of soldiers. And under the federal draft law, um, potentially any white male citizen between the age of 20 and 45 uh, could be drafted. 
This also included uh, immigrants that were uh, in the process of becoming citizens. So younger men, 18 and 19 year old males, and immigrants who were not trying to become citizens, they were exempt from the draft. And uh, white males in the Union that were citizens between the ages of 20 and 45, as well as uh, naturalizing immigrants um, who were now vulnerable to being drafted, they were very angry about uh, these draft laws. They viewed conscription as a form of slavery since they could not resist uh, government service and uh, they rioted across the Union. And there were uh, drafts, draft riots in many major Union cities. The most famous uh, draft riot took place in uh, New York City on July 4th, 1863. So right after the Battle of Gettysburg, there's a massive draft riot in New York City. Um, in this draft riot, um, a lot of poor men, many of whom were uh, Irish immigrants who were in the process of trying to become citizens, they rioted against the draft and they burned down buildings and they uh, killed African Americans, uh, as you can see here. Um, men in the Union who did not want to be drafted could pay a $300 uh, commutation fee, or they could hire a uh, substitute, another man, to take their place uh, in the draft. But most poor men could not afford to hire a substitute or pay $300. $300 in 1863 would be about $8,000 in 2023 money. And resistance to the draft would spawn the Copperhead movement in uh, the Union. Copperheads were usually part of the Democratic Party. They came from Democratic strongholds like uh, New York City, but also from places like Indiana and Ohio, um, Union states that were um, bordering uh, slave states in this case. And they opposed the Civil War, particularly the Civil War's focus uh, on slavery, the Union's uh, focus on emancipating slaves. They also opposed the Union war effort because they opposed the draft. The Copperheads um, repeated the line that the Civil War was a rich man's war and a poor man's fight. Um, they pointed out that rich men could um, pay draft commutation fees and they could hire substitutes and they could make money off of the war by selling goods and acting as contractors for the Union government. But they point out that it was poor men who would actually have to go fight and possibly be wounded or be killed in the war effort. So the Copperhead movement will be greatly strengthened by the uh, opposition to the draft in the Union in 1863. But uh, conscription is also going to be very controversial in the South as well, which we'll talk about in a moment. As controversial as the draft was in the Union, with draft riots, with the emergence of the Copperhead movement, the conscription in the Confederacy was even more controversial. And one of the reasons why conscription was so controversial in the Confederacy was because uh, drafts administered by a federal government, in this case the Confederate government, they really went against the Confederate or Southern notion of states' rights. Many Southerners uh, in the Confederacy pointed out that conscription violated many of the reasons why they were going to war against the Union in the first place, as it violated the rights of the uh, individual states to control um, how they brought uh, soldiers into the Confederate Army. Also, Confederate conscription was much more expansive than Union conscription. In 1862, uh, the Confederate government uh, passed conscription acts that made all white men uh, between the ages of 18 and 35 years old um, liable or eligible for uh, service, for being drafted. Um, of course, there were uh, exemptions, um, slave owners of over 20 slaves and overseers of over 20 slaves could be exempted, as we discussed previously. Uh, later in the year, the Confederate government extends uh, this universal white male conscription uh, to uh, men up to the age of 45. 
And of course, as I said, there are some exemptions for large slave owners and large overseers. That's a very small percentage of the white male uh, Southern Confederate population. By 1864, um, the Confederate government will actually be drafting 17-year-old um, boys and men in their 50s uh, for um, duration uh, of the war service. So the Confederate conscription is far more expansive than any kind of conscription uh, in, in the Union. A much larger percentage of the population is um, liable, potentially liable for service under uh, Confederate conscription laws. This makes conscription even more controversial in the South. And also there's the fact that conscription goes against the idea of states' rights because it's being administered by the Confederate government rather than by the states. And opposition to the war in the South is actually very strong, much stronger than um, popular culture would have you believe. A lot of people in the Confederacy oppose the Confederate government and oppose the Confederate war effort leading to separatist movements within the CSA. Um, in a previous video, we talked about uh, Western Virginia breaking off from Virginia and uh, joining uh, the Union or rejoining uh, the Union as the state of West Virginia. There were uh, anti-Confederate movements in Eastern Tennessee and Western North Carolina. There will be uh, a separatist movement in Mississippi called the Free State of Jones, which were opposed to uh, the Confederate government and Confederate policies, including uh, conscription. And um, Confederate soldiers uh, will, uh, will desert the Confederate army. Uh, they will hide out with family and friends, um, trying to avoid uh, conscript guards and uh, avoid being captured and, and forced back into service. Uh, men who are being uh, drafted will also hide, hide from conscript guards. So there's going to be a lot of resistance to uh, Confederate conscription. And this is because one, Confederate conscription is a lot more expansive than Union conscription. And two, the idea of conscription, um, it goes against uh, the Confederate idea of states' rights. For example, also, um, Confederate Vice President uh, Thaddeus Stevens will basically leave his position as Vice President and will return to his home in Georgia because he disagrees with Confederate policies, particularly the growth of the Confederate government. Stevens was a uh, state's rights uh, supporter, so he no longer felt that the Confederate government represented his uh, political views. So uh, white Southern men who did not want to serve in the Confederate army had very few uh, recourses to avoid uh, being conscripted. Um, Men in the Union, though, have more opportunities to avoid conscription, which we'll talk about in a moment. Like their adversaries to the South, uh, Northern men uh, found ways to resist the draft. Uh, some men in the North uh, had draft riots uh, discussed previously. Others uh, found more civil ways to avoid the draft. Uh, remember also that the uh, draft pool in the North is proportionally much smaller. The, uh, the Union is, is calling a smaller percentage of the uh, male population to be drafted than the Confederacy is. If a man were to be drafted in the North, he could hire a substitute. He might hire a poor man who needed um, money to take his place in the Union Army. He might also hire a immigrant that was not uh, trying to become a U.S. citizen because immigrants were, that were trying to become citizens could be drafted. Uh, he might also hire a uh, 18 or 19 year old man who was too young to be drafted to take his place in uh, the uh, Union Army. And men who were called for service but did not want to go they could also petition uh, their draft board to have their service commuted. They could claim they had uh, health problems. Um, soldiers had to undergo medical exams before joining uh, either the Union or the Confederate Army. These medical exams were uh, very cursory at best. They were not very thorough. But a man could claim that he was uh, too ill to serve in the Union Army and have his uh, draft be commuted.
He could also claim that um, he had hardships, that perhaps he was a widower with no wife, and if he were drafted, there would be no one to watch his children. Uh, there were ways that a, um, a union man, a northern man, could um, legally avoid being drafted. Of course, a northern man can avoid being drafted by volunteering for service in the Union Army. And if you volunteer as a, uh, a man in the Union, you can receive a uh, bounty. This bounty, of course, you will not receive until – most of it you will not receive until after your service is complete. But this bounty uh, could be up to $300, so it's the price of the draft commutation fee. Some men, um, hoping to avoid the draft, would load up their possessions, load up their family, and they would go to the West. They would claim homestead land out in the West because uh, the draft was not active in the Western territories. In the West, uh, the Union government preferred that people stay on their land, uh, establish homesteads to integrate the West rather than uh, leave their lands to go fight with, uh, with the Union Army. And some men uh, who were not able to hire a substitute, pay the commutation fee, or go to the West, they would uh, run away and they would become fugitives of the draft. About 20% of those called for service would actually become fugitives and they would hide out uh, avoiding the draft. So um, men in the Union found ways to avoid the draft just as men in the Confederacy did. But on the whole, men in the Union had more opportunities to avoid being conscripted than men in the Confederacy did. And with that, we'll continue our discussion of the general course of the U.S. Civil War. Some men violently resisted the draft, rioting in major urban centers like New York City on the first week of July, 1863, even as word of the Vicksburg and Gettysburg victories was being telegraphed back to Washington. Many of the urban rioters were Irish immigrants who opposed the war, its shifting goals, and their inability to avoid the draft. Anti-war sentiment was also very strong in Indiana, Illinois, and Ohio, where organizations like the Copperheads and the Knights of the Golden Circle denounced the continued fighting, declaring that the Civil War was a rich man's war and a poor man's fight. They also attacked Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation, saying that they would not fight for the freedom of black people. Remember that racism against black people was a major part of the dominant American culture, even after the beginning of the Civil War. While white men were refusing to join the, the, the Union Army, black men were enthusiastic about joining the military after the Emancipation Proclamation. They recognized that the Civil War was being fought to free their brethren in the South, and they were more willing to take part in this struggle for abolition. Black units, like the 54th Massachusetts, would convince white Northerners that black men were capable of military service and freedom. The black men who served in the Union Army did face discrimination in the ranks. Their commanding officers were all white, and they were initially paid less than their white comrades. Still, despite these inequities, but 180,000 black men fought in the Union Army, nearly 10% of the total number of Union troops. 25,000 fought in the Union Navy as well. Most of the black men who served were freedmen from the South, although many Northern blacks enlisted as well. About 40,000 died during their service. Black Union soldiers, called the U.S. Colored Troops, had a higher death rate than white soldiers, dying at a rate of about 20%, while whites died at about a 15% rate. In response to the Union Army's arming of black men, the Confederate government declared that capturing, captured black Union soldiers would be enslaved and that white officers would be executed for inciting a slave uprising. The Lincoln administration promised that for every black soldier that was enslaved and every officer that was cap executed, the Union would set a Confederate prisoner of war to hard labor and execute a captured officer. Although neither side really made good on these promises for the most part. It is also worth noting the Confederacy considered arming slaves to fight against the Union, 
This proposal was widely unpopular with Southern whites, who feared that the arming of slaves might provoke an uprising. Others argued that if blacks could serve in the military, then they would have to be freed and given equality. Most of the Southern states, either before or during the war, had passed laws preventing black men from taking up military service. Proposals for the arming of black men by Confederate officers, like Patrick Cleborne's in early 1864, were rejected. The Confederacy did not officially allow slaves to serve in the ranks of its army until March of 1865, and only then with the permission of the, their masters. But by then, the war was effectively lost for the CSA. Free black men occasionally served in southern state militias, like the Louisiana Home Guards in 1861. But this unit was disbanded by the Confederate government in early 1862, and many of the free black men who served in the Louisiana Home Guards would go on to serve in the Union Louisiana Militia after the U.S. occupied the state. Isolated reports of black men fighting in an unofficial capacity in the Confederate Army in 1865, before 1865 exist. And we know that some black men served in the Confederate Navy in non-combat non capacities, but their numbers have been significantly exaggerated, both at the time of the Civil War and in recent years. We also do not know if all of these black men served of their own volition, or if they were involuntarily accompanying a master who was in their ranks. Black men were more likely to serve as laborers for the Confederate Army, usually under the orders of their masters, who would be paid by the Confederacy for their slaves' military labor. Some of this confusion about the supposed black Confederates has arisen because black laborers working for the Confederate Army often donned cast-off military uniforms to replace their inadequate slave clothing. The Northern press also misrepresented the work these laborers did, to cast the CSA as barbarous and hypocritical for making slaves serve as soldiers. These myths about black Confederates are still with us today. Women were also mobilized in new and more extensive ways in the Civil War, both in the Union and in the Confederacy. In the North as well as the South, women took jobs outside of the home that had been vacated by men who were in the military, or they found new op occupations, particularly, particularly in industrial manufacturing, that had been created to keep the Yankee Leviathan and rebel war machines going. Women had worked in manufacturing for decades, especially in New England, so female industrial labor, labor was not unprecedented. What was new was that women were working to produce highly explosive and dangerous munitions. Both the Union and the Confederacy saw serious and deadly industrial munitions plant accidents. In Richmond, Virginia in 1863, the Browns Island explosion killed over 40 female munitions workers. In Pittsburgh's 1862 Allegheny Arsenal explosion killed over 78 workers, most of whom were young women. Women would also work in agricultural labor as well, allowing their husbands and sons to serve in the military. Women had worked on their fathers' and husbands' farms for years, completing tasks like taking care of livestock, in processing and preserving fruits and vegetables, while the men were more likely to work in the fields, plowing, sowing, and harvesting. Women began to do more field work during the Civil War, as the conflict led to the undermining of peacetime gender roles. With the loss of their male relatives, many women, especially in the South, discovered that they did not have the necessary labor to keep their families fed. As a result, women across the CSA petitioned the Confederate government to release their sons, brothers, or husbands from military service so they could come home and work for their families. The wages the Confederate government paid its soldiers were not enough to keep a family going, 
especially as inflation of the Confederate currency increased throughout the war. The Confederate government would sometimes allow these soldiers to return home, but it would also take steps to provide food and money to families that were missing their breadwinners. To accompany its near universal healthy white male draft, the Confederate government had created its own welfare state, a clear violation of its supposed commitment to limited government and states' rights. When Southern women could not get the help they needed from the Confederate government, many organized protests, some of which escalated to riots, wherein the angry, desperate female protesters stole food for their families, as seen during the Richmond Bread Riots of April 2nd, 1863. Southern women also helped hide their men from conscript guards who were tasked with arresting fugitive draft dodgers. Once again, the Confederate government had greatly increased its power by forcing white men to run away in order to seek freedom, a little bit like enslaved people had done. Northern women, in contrast, petitioned the Union government to have their men released from service, but their petitions tended to be less successful because of the abundance of male immigrants who could take jobs left behind by men in the military. As was the case during the Revolutionary War, women also served as camp followers, providing important logistical services to the troops in both the Union and Confederate armies. The tasks they saw included helping the sick and wounded, gathering and cooking food, washing and fixing uniforms, and, often illicitly, sex work which was generally illegal, although some Union officers experimented with the legalization of prostitution. Black women, especially ex-slaves, served as camp followers in the Union Army, and enslaved people often served Confederate soldiers, although they did so as slaves, not free people willingly working and making wages for themselves. In both the South and the North, women's role in nursing changed immensely during the Civil War, expanding and becoming more official and professionalized. Women have taken care of the sick and wounded during the wartime for millennia, but in the 19th century United States, there was a stigma around women working as nurses. Some feared, quite misogynistically, that women did not have the constitutions to work as nurses and witness grievous wounds in grisly medical procedures like amputations. Some also worried that female nurses might be taken advantage of by male doctors and patients. Some, especially in the upper classes, believed that it was acceptable for women to serve as nurses, but they should do so as volunteers and not receive a wage for their nursing work. A lot of people in American society still viewed wage earning as distasteful, especially when taken up by women, who were supposed to be provided for by their husbands or fathers. The work of nurses like Clara Barton and Mary Ann Bickerdyke in the North and Phoebe Pember in the Confederacy helped to professionalize nursing for women in the United States, following in the footsteps of other well-known nurses like Florence Nightingale. These American nurses created new procedures and developed new techniques for the care of the sick and wounded soldiers, making the field more scientific and professional. Some nurses, especially Clara Barton, even put their lives on the line during their work taking care of wounded men in the midst of ongoing battles. Black women often served as nurses as well, including Susie King Taylor. Some women, like Dr. Mary Walker, served as physicians as well, but this was far less common due to contemporary beliefs about education for women. Some women also took up arms and fought in the Civil War. As was the case in the American Revolutionary War, women were officially barred from serving in the army as soldiers. Consequently, women who wanted to fight with either the Union or Confederate armies disguised themselves as men. Perhaps the most well-known woman to disguise herself as a man was Sarah Edmonds, who served as a soldier in the Union army under the alias Franklin Thompson. It is likely that there were many other women who disguised themselves as men to fight in the war, especially towards the end of the conflict as both the Union and Confederate governments eased up on their medical exams that were required for service. Harriet Tubman, whom we discussed in a previous video, 
serve as an armed guide and scout for Union troops in South Carolina in 1863. She did so as herself, not pretending to be a man. Women also served as spies in the Civil War, taking advantage of the gender norms of the day that held that women were more honest and trustworthy than men. Women who were spies were very unlikely to be suspected of the duplicity that was required to be an effective secret agent. Some of the most well-known spies were Rose Greenhow and Belle Boyd, who passed information about Union troop movements to the Confederacy. African-American women, especially enslaved women, acted as spies as well for the Union Army, giving information to federal troops once they had reached their lines. Now, back to 1864. In 1864, the Union would continue its escalation of its attacks against the Confederacy, but it would also continue its blockade of southern ports using its superior naval power. The Confederates recognized they could not go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Union Navy. Instead, they continued their policy of using blockade runners to skirt the Union obstruction of ports. They would also add commerce raiders to their fleets. Commerce raiders were essentially privateers that worked for the Confederacy. Commerce raiders were fast, lightly armed ships that were designed to attack Union mercantile shipping. They did not have the weapons or armor to take on Union naval vessels, much less the more powerful ironclads, so the commerce raiders would stick to attacking civilian merchant ships. Perhaps the most famous Confederate commerce raider was the CSS Alabama, which harassed Union shipping from 1862 to July 29, 1864, when it was sunk off the coast of Cherbourg, France. A favorite target of Confederate commerce raiders were Yankee whaling ships. The commerce raiders, with the adoption of kerosene, a substitute for whale oil, basically destroyed the American whaling industry in the 1860s. Hoping to break through the blockades, which were having a devastating effect on the southern economy, the Confederate Navy was also experimenting with submarines, called fish or porpoises in the contemporary vernacular. The most famous Confederate submarine, the CSS H.L. Hunley, sank a Union blockade vessel, the USS Housatonic, off the coast of Charleston, South Carolina, on February 17, 1864. The Hunley, a tiny vessel, was 40 feet long and had a beam of 3.83 feet. She was powered by a hand crank worked by her nine-man crew and armed with a small torpedo on a spar, which she rammed into the Housatonic's wooden hull. The torpedo exploded, sinking the Union vessel. The Hunley was so small less than four feet tall on the inside, that her crew could not stand up once they had entered the fish. For undetermined reasons, the Hunley mysteriously sank during her attack on the Housatonic, taking her nine crewmen to a watery grave. There are many mysteries as to why the Hunley sank, and scholars do not entirely agree on the reasons for this vessel's failure. After this attack, the Confederate government gave up on its experiments with submarines. Eighteen sixty four was going to be a critical year of fighting for both the Union and the Confederacy, on land as well. Why? Because it was a presidential election year. Whoever would become the next president of the United States would determine whether the U.S. Civil War would continue until the Confederacy had been brought back into the Union or if the CSA would be allowed to leave. Remember, the South's military might, which was already weaker than the North's, had taken a severe blow in 1863 at Vicksburg and Gettysburg. The only practical way that the CSA could gain independence would be if the Union public gave up on the war 
and elected a pro-peace president. President Lincoln recognized this and knew he would, have, he would need some important military victories in 1864 if he were to remain president and continue the war. To this end, he made Ulysses S. Grant, the hero of Vicksburg, commanding general-in-chief of the Union forces. Grant was now in command of Western troops and the Army of the Potomac in the Eastern Theater. Grant adopted an aggressive strategy against the Confederacy in both the East and the West. Grant would take advantage of the Union's greater population, higher wealth, and supply reserves to wear down the much weaker Confederacy. Grant recognized this, this strategy would certainly lead to more casualties on both sides. But the Union could replace its lost soldiers far more easily than the Confederates could, who were already extending their conscription to include 17-year-old boys and aging 50-year-old men. In the Eastern Theater, Grant went to work against Lee and the Confederates, promising Lincoln that he would fight an overland campaign and succeed where Union generals before him had failed. He would destroy the Confederate army and capture Richmond, even if it took all summer. Grant attacked Lee in the wilderness, the same place that Joseph Hooker had faltered on May 5th through 7th, 1864. In the wilderness, the troops ominously marched past the bleached bones of the dead who had been left unburied from the battle a year before, an eerie foreshadowing of the violence that was to come. Grant's army, over 118,000 strong, outnumbered Lee's nearly two to one, and Grant hoped to use his superior numbers to crush Lee. Grant was a very different officer than his predecessors in the East. Grant was not slow and timid like George McClellan and Ambrose Burnside, nor was he brash and overconfident like John Pope and Joseph Hooker. Grant was aggressive, but he was very aware of his own limitations as well. Grant attacked Lee in the wilderness, but he struggled to move his infantry and artillery through the brush and scrub the region giving Lee a tactical advantage as a defender. To make matters worse, Sparks set the dry scrub ablaze, burning countless wounded soldiers to death in the battle's aftermath. In the end, Lee held his position and lost fewer troops than Grant, about 11,000 to Grant's 18,000. The battle was a quasi victory for Lee and the Confederates, since he had held his position and had lost fewer troops than his enemy. That being said, a lower proportion of Grant's troops became casualties than Lee's. Remember, Grant would have a far easier time replacing lost troops than Lee would. Grant once again attacked Lee, but this time from the east at Spotsylvania Courthouse on May 9th through 21st, 1864. This battle was even bloodier than the wilderness, with over 18,000 Union and 12,000 Confederate casualties and was considered a draw. Grant attacked Lee again at the Battles of North Anna, May 23rd through 26th, and Cold Harbor, May 31st through June 12th. North Anna was another draw, but Cold Harbor was a clear Confederate victory. On June 3rd, at Cold Harbor, Grant's troops charged the Confederates, who were entrenched on a defensible hill. During the attack, which lasted only a couple of hours, Grant's army lost over 7,000 troops in one assault on the CS position. Grant, Grant later wrote that the assault on Cold Harbor was one of his greatest regrets, since the assault had caused a massive loss of life for no tactical advantage. In the end, Grant was not able to keep his promise to Lincoln of capturing Richmond by the end of the summer. Instead, Grant elected to wait out Lee besieging the Army of Northern Virginia in the town of Petersburg, just outside of Richmond. Because of the high casualties incurred during the Overland Campaign, the Northern press criticized Grant and called him a butcher. They also pressured Lincoln to remove Grant from command. Lincoln refused, though, saying, I cannot spare this man. He fights. During the Overland Campaign and the Siege of Petersburg, Grant would authorize his cavalry commander, General Philip H. Sheridan, 
to attack and destroy the farms of the Shenandoah Valley, where Stonewall Jackson had humiliated the Federals two years before. Sheridan's assaults on civilians had a threefold purpose. One, the attacks were supposed to trick Lee into abandoning his position in Petersburg to relieve the Shenandoah Valley, where his troops would be destroyed by Sheridan. Two, the attacks would destroy the agriculture of the Shenandoah Valley, the breadbasket of the South, starving the Confederates into submission. Three, the targeted destruction of civilian property in the Shenandoah Valley would demoralize the Confederate citizenry, motivating them to call for peace. Grant's commitment to destroy Lee's Confederate troops and his authorization of Philip Sheridan's campaign in the Shenandoah Valley represented a change in Union military policy that had begun with the Emancipation Proclamation of 1862. The Union was no longer fighting a limited war that was just against the Confederate military. Rather, the Union was now doing everything it could to win the war and defeat the CSA, including attacking the Southern culture and economy by freeing slaves and destroying civilian property. Lee refused to leave Petersburg, so Grant drew on the tactic, tactics that he had used at Vicksburg back in 1863 to wear down the Confederates in the city. Grant's engineers constructed forts and trenches around the city, and the fighting was very slow, much as it would be during World War I in the 20th century. Grant's army also tried more novel tactics, as seen during the Battle of the Crater, where Union sappers, sappers are soldiers who work with explosives, blasted a massive crater in the Rebel line. Union troops, many of whom were black, charged into the hole, only to be slaughtered by the Confederates. The battles of the Overland Campaign and the Siege of Petersburg, while they did not, they did wear down the Confederates, they did not give Lincoln the kind of military victories he needed to assure re-election. If anything, the anti-war press took advantage of the bloody, slow fighting of Virginia, casting Grant as a butcher and Lincoln as an out-of-touch radical for continuing such a violent and costly war. In the Western theater, the major fighting of 1864 would center on Georgia. In Georgia, General William Tecumseh Sherman, commander of the armies of the Cumberland, the Ohio, and the Tennessee, prepared to advance southward to capture Atlanta. Atlanta was a huge Confederate city and a major railroad hub. The Union capture of Atlanta would effectively cut Virginia and the Carolinas off from the Deep South. Sherman, like Grant, had become a very aggressive general and used the strategies of attrition and living off the land to wear down Confederate resistance. Sherman was also known for his eccentric behavior. He'd even been relieved of command early in the war due to a mental breakdown. Many scholars compare William Tecumseh Sherman to Stonewall Jackson of the Confederate Army for their strategic intensity and personality quirks. In the foothills of northern Georgia, Sherman fought a series of battles against the Confederate Army of the Tennessee commanded by Joseph E. Johnston, whom we discussed before. Sherman had about 112,000 troops and outnumbered Johnston nearly two to one. Sherman used his superior numbers as well as supplies brought by whale and wa rail and wagon from Chattanooga, Tennessee, to keep his army resupplied on its southward advance. The Union had captured Chattanooga in late 1863. Johnston, in contrast, struggled to keep his army resupplied. In a desperate bid to stop Sherman, Johnson also tried to cut off the Union resupply network, sending the infamous cavalry commander, General Nathan Bedford Forrest, to raid the Union flank. Forrest was a brilliant cavalry officer and tactician, and a self-educated man, but he had been a slave trader before the war, and his troops had massacred black soldiers and Tennessean Unionists in the Fort Pillow Massacre of April 12, 1864. Forrest was also accused of murdering a subordinate. Forrest would go on to establish the Ku Klux Klan after the war. The massacre of the surrendering Black and Tennessean Union troops was considered a war crime. But Forrest was never punished for the actions of his troops 
because he did not give them the order to kill the prisoners. Another war crime that occurred during the Civil War under the command of an officer was the Sand Creek Massacre of November 29, 1864, in the Colorado Territory. At Sand Creek, Union soldiers and Colorado militia, commanded by John Chivington of Glorietta Pass, killed up to 150 Cheyenne and Arapaho Indians, most of whom were women and children. Chivington's army was angry at the killing of settlers by the Cheyenne dog soldiers, but the people they killed were mostly non-combatants who had nothing to do with the violence. The angry soldiers killed men, women, and children, hacking up their bodies and taking body parts as souvenirs. The Sand Creek Massacre disgusted the Northern public, but Chivington and his men were never held accountable for their war crimes. Across the 19th century, white American opinion of Native Americans had become more negative and racialized due to a variety of factors we've already discussed in this course. The fact that some Native Americans had attacked settlers and fought with the Confederates was enough to excuse the brutal violence of the Sand Creek Massacre to many Northerners. To, nor to Northerners, Sand Creek was wrong, even a war crime, but little needed to be done for the victims since the Indians were red rebels, supposedly allied with the Confederacy. The Cheyenne and the Arapaho were not Confederate allies, but they had been racialized by white Northerners, who held all Indians responsible for attacks on both settlers and the Union. There were only two men who were executed for war crimes during the Civil War. Champ Ferguson, a Confederate guerrilla who killed white civilians, and Captain Henry Words, the Commandant of Camp Sumter, a Confederate prison camp for Union POWs in Andersonville, Georgia. Conditions for POWs in the Civil War were generally awful due to disease, overcrowding, and abuse from guards, but the starvation that killed a large proportion of the Union prisoners at Andersonville was not really Words' fault, leading some to argue that he was unfairly executed. Anyway, back to the Atlanta campaign. Johnston's delaying action was not working, and Sherman's army kept advancing, pushing him to the suburbs of Atlanta after a series of battles in northwest Georgia. Sherman then besieged Atlanta, trapping Johnston's beleaguered force inside the city. Frustrated with Johnston's retreating, Jefferson Davis removed Joe Johnston from command and replaced him with a more aggressive John Bell Hood. Hood attempted a Confederate breakout of Atlanta. Hood did not have enough troops or supplies to accomplish this ambitious plan, and he ultimately hastened Sherman's capture of the city by wasting scarce Confederate troops and materiel in a hopeless attempt to lift the siege. Hood ultimately retreated, and Sherman's men captured Atlanta on September 1, 1864. On the way out of the city, Hood's men set fire to the town's supply depots and, and railway station. Sherman's army entered the flaming city victorious, having destroyed the Confederate military presence in northern Georgia, while also capturing an important CS rail hub. Sherman informed Lincoln of his success, telling him the city was ours and fairly won, and that he had cut the coastal south in half. Now we'll talk about the U.S. presidential election of 1864. Abraham Lincoln ran for re-election for the Republican Party, which had rebranded itself as the National Union Party. Its primary policies were continuing the war and ending slavery via a constitutional amendment, among other uh, issues which uh, we will not discuss here. The Republican slash National Union Party ran against the Democratic Party. George B. McClellan was the uh, Democratic uh, Party's nominee for president. The Democratic Party in the 1864 election was divided between pro-war Democrats who wanted to continue the war against the Confederacy and anti-war or peace Democrats, uh, also known as Copperheads. And the Copperheads wanted to end the Civil War at all costs, even if it meant Union defeat and slavery continuing um, in the South. And the Democrats and the Copperheads uh, attacked Lincoln on his record, particularly on uh, his 
support of African Americans. And of course, they also attacked Lincoln for continuing the war. But as I said, the Democratic Party is also very divided. Their presidential nominee, McClellan, is open to continuing the war, whereas the Copperheads uh, want to end the war. And the Copperheads will control the platform of the Democratic uh, Party during the election. So um, McClellan's pro-war opinions are going to be minimized uh, throughout the campaign. And in the spring and summer of 1864, this would have been the uh, most politically expedient thing to do for the Democrats because the high casualties during Grant's overland campaign, Sherman's slow progress in Georgia uh, would have made it seem like the war was not going well for the Union. But General Sherman's capture of Atlanta in September of 1864 uh, was a sign that the Confederacy was now losing the war. Uh, and that the Confederacy could not win this war, and that it was only a matter of time before the Union won. And this, of course, would really play into uh, Lincoln and his promise to continue the war and to ensure a Union victory. So in the end, the Democratic Party's message was very confused during the 1864 election. And in the end, it was also the wrong message, because the Union was winning the war, and the Battle of Atlanta and the capture of Atlanta proved that. And Northern voters responded resoundingly uh, for the Republican Party. They voted for Lincoln. Uh, Lincoln beat McClellan by about 10 points in the popular vote. And he took all of the Northern states except for New Jersey, uh, McClellan's home state. Uh, he did not win the border slave state of Kentucky or Delaware. But Lincoln did win the... Um, reconstructed southern states of Tennessee and Louisiana. These states had been readmitted to the Union under the 10% plan. The 10% plan uh, was a reconstruction provision. Basically, the 10% plan would allow uh, former Confederate states to rejoin the Union if 10% of their 1860 census population would take a oath of loyalty to the Union, and then the new state government would abolish slavery. Although Lincoln certainly could have won without these uh, reconstructed states. I should also note the military vote as well. About 40,000 uh, active duty or deployed Union soldiers voted in the uh, 1864 presidential election. For context, there were at least uh, 600,000 active duty Union soldiers uh, in 1864, so only a small percentage of them actually were able to vote in the election. But those that did uh, voted uh, commandingly for Lincoln, about 75% uh, voted for Lincoln over McClellan, which is interesting because McClellan had been a very popular uh, general amongst Union troops, as discussed in a previous video. But uh, Lincoln's message of winning the war uh, was very popular amongst Union soldiers, especially uh, after events like the Battle of Atlanta, which convinced the northern public that uh, the war was going to be a Union victory if they just held on a little bit longer. Sherman's march to the sea would go 300 miles southeast across Georgia and end in Savannah, from November 15th to December 21st, 1864. During the March to the Sea, Sherman's army would have to abandon its supply lines and live off the Georgia countryside. Sherman's troops would also target and destroy Georgian property, both public and private along the way, anything that could be used by the Confederates to continue the war. This region of Georgia had, until this point, been largely untouched by the fighting. Sherman planned to change that and make Georgia howl for its decision to secede from the Union and join the Confederacy. Sherman's troops destroyed railroads, factories, and plantations, and they foraged food from the Georgian countryside, food that Southern civilians needed to stay alive. Soldiers also sexually assaulted Southern women, both white and black, although Sherman tried to stop this type of sexual violence, as it had nothing to do with the Union's war effort. In subsequent years, Scholars have debated Sherman's march to the sea, 
both its military efficacy and its morality. Some have argued that the attacks and depredations against civilians accounted, amounted to uncivilized total war and were planned by Sherman, a barbarous madman. Others argue that Sherman's march was legitimate as it was, it was intended to target and destroy Southern military and economic production, much like air bombing raids in World War II were used by both the Allies and the Axis to destroy their enemies' ability to make war. Scholars have also debated whether Sherman intentionally targeted Southern civilians, or if the violence committed against them during the march was incidental or collateral damage. Most historians agree that Sherman's strategy was not total war, nor was it the limited war that the Union had used in 1861 and 1862. Instead, scholars argue that by 1864, the Civil War had become a hard war, as seen during the fighting in the Western Theater in Georgia and in Virginia in 1864 during Grant's Overland Campaign. After Sherman captured Savannah in December, a Christmas gift for Mr. Lincoln, Union victory in the Civil War seemed all but assured. Sherman's victories in Georgia would convince Congress to pass the 13th Amendment to the Constitution, which brought slavery to an end throughout the entire United States, including the slaveholding Union border states. Slavery would also be forbidden in all Confederate states brought back into the Union as well. Sherman continued his march northward towards South Carolina, the heart of secession. In general, Sherman's troops' actions against the South Carolinians were more severe because they believed that the Palmetto State was responsible for starting the Civil War. Sherman's troops traveled up the coast and then turned inland towards Columbia, the capital. Columbia caught on fire during Sherman's movement into the city, although there was debate about whether the fires started accidentally or had been set in in intentionally either by the Union or the Confederates. When the trustees of Columbia's University of South Carolina begged Sherman for assistance fighting the fire on their campus, fearing that their library would be destroyed, Sherman famously said that if South Carolinians had spent more time reading books, then maybe their books would not be burning now. After cutting his way through South Carolina, Sherman entered North Carolina and fought his old adversary, Joseph E. Johnston, at the Battle of Bentonville from March 19th through 21st, 1865, a Union victory. While Sherman was marching through the Carolinas, Grant broke through the Confederate lines at Petersburg during the Battle of Five Forks, often called the Waterloo of the Confederacy. Grant captured Richmond, forcing Davis and the Confederate government to retreat southward. Lee's Army of Northern Virginia retreated westward towards the Appalachian Mountains, where he hoped to find supplies and continue the fighting. Grant, however, managed to outflank Lee, blocking him to the west near Lynchburg. The Army of Northern Virginia, exhausted and out of supplies, and nearly surrounded by Grant's troops, had little chance of escape, so Lee surrendered on April 9, 1865 at Appomattox Courthouse. In response to Lee's surrender, Confederate armies across the South stood down and the Confederate government capitulated as well. The last Confederate general to surrender to Union forces was Brigadier General Stan Wadey of the Cherokee Nation. Small scale guerrilla warfare would take place in the South, however, into the early 1870s. Although most of this fighting was a reaction to the US government's reconstruction policies, than it was a continued fight for secession. On April 14, 1865, Abraham Lincoln went to see a play at Ford's Theater to celebrate Lee's surrender and the fact that the war was ending. As Lincoln watched the play called The American Cousin, a pro-Confederate actor named John Wilkes Booth sneaked into the presidential box and shot Lincoln in the back of the head Booth then escaped, jumping out of the box while shouting in Latin, Six Semper Tyrannis, thus always to tyrants. Lincoln would die from his wound the next morning at 7.22 a.m.
The Union states mourned Lincoln's death. He was the first U.S. president to die of assassination. Federal troops eventually caught up with Booth, who was killed in a shootout with the soldiers in Virginia. Booth's co-conspirators had planned to assassinate key members of Lincoln's cabinet to avenge the South, but they failed and were hanged for treason on July 7, 1865. Even as the northern states celebrated their victory of the Confederacy and their preservation of the Union and the abolition of slavery, they mourned the loss of their president, whom the poet Walt, Will, Walt Whitman called Captain My Captain. The U.S. Civil War was an immensely significant event in both U.S. and world history. The Civil War was the bloodiest war fought on American soil, and more Americans died in the Civil War than in any other armed conflict in which the U.S. took part. There were over 750,000 military casualties and countless more civilian deaths as a result of the war as well. Scholars estimate that up to a million Americans either died in or because of the Civil War. Over four million enslaved Africans in both the Union and the Confederacy gained their freedom in what was the largest war to end slavery. The abolition of slavery in the U.S. would inspire the abolition of slavery in Cuba and Brazil. Scholars have argued that the Union's triumph over the Confederacy proved the efficacy of American Democratic Republican government, validating the struggle of the Patriots in the Revolutionary War. Abraham Lincoln, back when he was alive, in his November 1863 Gettysburg Address, declared that the Civil War was fought to ensure that government of the people, by the people, and for the people shall not perish from the earth. And scholars tend to agree. The abolition of slavery and the service of blacks in the Civil War also helped to redefine how white people across the Americas and Europe saw people of color, helping to spread ideas of racial equality. Some of these ideas would become popular after the war. Others would take another century or more to catch on. More would have to be done to assure equal rights for all in the 20th century and beyond. Technologically and militarily, the Civil War was significant as well. It was the only conflict in world history in which both belligerents fought primarily with rifled, muzzle-loading muskets. Remember that cavalry in the Civil War carried breech lo loaders, but the cavalry was only a small proportion of the Union and Confederate armies. In previous wars, armies had fought each other primarily with smoothbore muskets, which were far less accurate than rifles. Rifles were only issued to snipers or were carried by militiamen who provided their own firearms. In, co in subsequent conflicts after the Civil War, belligerents fought each other with breech-loading rifles of the lever-action, bolt-action, semi-automatic, or automatic varieties. Rifle muskets were far more accurate than smooth bores, which has led some historians to argue that this is why the Civil War was such a bloody conflict, although others disagree stating that Civil War tactics were not advanced enough to fully take advantage of the rifle's superior accuracy. Despite the ferocity of the fighting in the Civil War, disease was the greatest killer in the conflict, as germ and antiseptic theory in the 1860s was in its infancy and would not really take on much popularity until after the war. Medical treatments during the U.S. Civil War were primitive compared to what we have access to today. Surgeons amputated limbs that had been struck by bullets to prevent infectious gangrene, but many amputees still died of infection because they had been treated with unsanitary equipment and bandages. Additionally, physicians did not have antibiotics to give to the sick and injured. Instead, they dosed convalescing troops with drugs like morphine, laudanum, and calomel. Mixed with alcohol, these concoctions caused drug addictions among Civil War veterans, contributing to the misery caused by the war. Engineers and scientists experimented with new military technologies as well. Northern engineer Richard Gatling developed an automatic crank-operated Gatling gun, the world's first machine gun, although this weapon did not see official use during the war. Shipbuilders in both the North and the South experimented with ironclad technology, 
revolutionizing naval combat as well. Confederate engineers, out of, des out of desperation, would even experiment with submarines, but these submersible vessels would not become practical until World War I, with the development of the internal combustion engine and more powerful batteries. The massive spending, mobilization, and loss of life during the Civil War created a military-industrial complex in the northern states, leading to the growth of the modern American state, while also inspiring the industrialization of the Gilded Age. The Union government used income taxes to pay for the war and printed extra currency, greenbacks, to fund the war and pay, for, pay the troops. As the northern economy grew and industrialized because of the Civil War, the southern economy was all but destroyed and had to be reconstructed in the 1870s. The South would remain more agrarian and less urban and industrial, lagging behind the rest of the country even to this day. The Civil War, its causes, the motivations of its combatants, and the ways in which it was fought can still be felt today.